Hello and welcome back, everyone. This is our third installment of this series uh, where we are talking about the natural history of planet Earth until we figure out the... Uh, and it will be the only natural history that we can talk about until we find life on other planets. So, you know, here's hoping, maybe one day. Uh, to you know, Joining me on this episode is the one and only Dapper Dinosaur. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm here. I'm Dapper Dinosaur. I run a channel called Dapper Dinosaur. It's got stuff like this. It's got creationism debunking. And I might actually be now a more frequent guest than anyone on Jackson Weed's <laughs> intro video. If I had a nickel for every nickel, then I'd have nickels. That's true. Uh, <laughs> well, Dapper, uh, my favorite theropod um we have covered so far in this series uh the the precambrian which was uh the first like 3.5 billion years of earth's history yes the we vast covered, majority yeah we covered that in all of one episode <laughs> and then we covered about about 240 million years in the last episode 200 well mm -hmm. i think about 200 million years something like that so this time and, we'll cover about what 200 or sorry 20 million years or so yeah yes yeah so just a portion of the carboniferous and then yeah just two million years and we're just gonna get like we're gonna get down to like a day in the life of the carboniferous you know yeah we're, we're gonna watch like one mega neura start to grow up from a little naiad <laughs> it's gonna be great that'll be it that's how we'll finish the series <laughs> um so yeah all right and of course peter's hosting this as always so thank you peter as always and let's get into it shall we let's do it all right so here we are in the carboniferous the uh the coal bearing period which is what that means um so this period lasted from about 359 to 299 million years ago uh, we met tetrapods, the very first tetrapods, in the previous episode. And actually, if you haven't seen it today, uh, Arn Ra met with uh, Neil Shubin, the paleontologist, uh, well, one of the, the team members who found Tiktaalik up in the Canadian Arctic. So that's pretty cool. By the way, today is April 21st, if you happen to be watching this on a recording. Yes. If you're watching this in the year 3000, welcome. Happy to have you. And, yes. And Please forgive us our quaint ways. And if you're in Europe, it's April the 22nd. The same. Well, true. That's the worst. But, anyways, uh, so we met the first tetrapods, the stem tetrapods, and now they are starting to undergo their own um, radiation. So, tetra tetrapoda as a clade is um, all the vertebrates that develop inside an amniotic sac that includes reptiles. No, birds, that's amniota. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oof, look what I did. I'm sorry. And I wasn't even reading my thing. Tetrapods are the four limbed uh, vertebrates. So amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And then within tetrapods, we get the very first amniotes, which are the tetrapods who develop inside an amniotic sac. So reptiles, birds, and mammals. Um, and then, and so we'll meet them a little bit later on uh they first appear in the carboniferous and uh, they have a radiation towards the end of the carboniferous which will have important uh important consequences for later on in the paleozoic and then the mesozoic and cenozoic ultimately um we talked about plants so there are already tree-ish things and the first sort of like true trees uh we have the uh, pro gymnosperms that were first starting to appear at the end of the devonian and we also have the the tree like uh lycophytes like uh 
sigil was it sigillaria uh and so uh, you know there are forests now it's not it's the the land cover isn't just like ferns and um and little little mosses there are actually trees now and so as there's there more and larger plants they can you know venture away from the the just uh the sort of uh wet, yeah the wet you know coastal semi-aquatic areas they can move more inland and we talked about the actually did we did we talk about the end of the devonian in the last episode yeah we did we talked about it at the very start of the devonian slide um, which, as we discussed then, caused uh, uh, mineral leaching out of the soil as the trees were basically going deeper with their roots than any plants had. And that caused minerals to be leached into the water supply, which caused eutrophic uh, eutrophication and um, global cooling as well. So thanks, trees, for killing everything. Real kind of you. I mean, they're just uh, following in the footsteps of the penis worms. That's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> following in the wormy burrows. Uh, and so this is also causing an increase in oxygen levels. And remember from when we talked about the uh, oxygen uh, increase at the, well, both during the great oxygenation event and also at the end of the Ediacaran leading into the early Cambrian, the raising of oxygen levels leads to organisms being able to grow larger because they can do more cellular respiration, get more cellular energy, uh, which is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And so in this period, we're going to see some really large arthropods like Meganeura, which is a griffin fly. It is not a dragonfly. It is actually a different group, although I believe they're pretty closely related. Um, They're in Odonata. They're basically yeah. branching to the modern Odonates, which are the damselflies and the dragonflies. Right. Yeah. They, it's it's just I've seen people say like, oh, it's just a dragonfly. Like, no, it's no. not just a dragonfly. It is, there are differences. Yep. Um, One of the most prominent being that uh, griffinflies have prominent cerci, which are the two antenna-like projections from the rearmost segment of the abdomen, which neither damselflies nor dragonflies tend to retain. Nice. There you go. And then uh, Arthur Plura, I don't remember. I may have a slide with him on it a little bit later, but there's one right Plura, here. I mean, like a, a picture all his own, but yes, you can see oh. there's like, I think that's like Varanops in the foreground and then like Ariops or no, Moss Chops, I think is the other one in the in sort of the. No, Moss Chops is Triassic. Is it? Okay, maybe it is Ariops then I'm thinking of. At any rate, um, no, Ariops is an amphibian. That guy's a. A synapse back there, isn't he? I honestly can't make it out this small, so maybe. At any rate, uh, at this point, enough. they didn't look all that different, which is an interesting thing about <laughs> evolution. Because yeah, that's true. One yeah. of the things we talk about is that as you go back in time, the groups start to look more and more alike. And so when you go back this far back in time, synapsids, diapsids, and reptilomorphs, which you would nowadays kind of say are like sort of amphibian ish, they all looked pretty similar, at least, you know. Yes. Yeah, uh, I believe I have a slide where we highlight that fact um, with regard to the early uh, amniotes in each of the, the three major clades, but we'll get to that shortly. Um, so Arthropora is a member of of Myriapo Myriapoda, so it's related to the millipedes and centipedes. I believe it is, in fact, a millipede. Um, a really honking big millipede. I, it was like what four feet long, something like that. It was crazy. Uh, at least four feet, I think. Or, I, I mean, think the it... largest species were. I believe it varied depending on the species, right. but yeah. Um. Yep, you get lots of so plants dying, being buried as coal, or, or being buried, and you get lots of coal buildup. Um, and the Carboniferous like the Devonian, ended with an extinction event because, as we explained before, it's relatively convenient to end um, or start geologic periods with big faunal turnovers. That makes it easy to identify. And so the Carboniferous ended with the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. So the world got uh, more arid, uh, I believe, uh, in more of this, this you know, tropical rainforest, rainforesty environment, uh, which became more arid, towards the end 
and this uh, killed off a lot of organisms who were more adapted to that uh, rainforesty environment. So at the start of the Carboniferous, you get a big radiation of amphibians who then die off as a many of whom die off as a result of the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. And then you get a big radiation of amniotes at the end of the Carboniferous and into the Permian. So those are sort of the highlights. Uh, anything you'd like to add, Dapper? Um, I mean, this is when we get a lot of the, the sort of quote unquote living fossil groups start to come around at this point. Mm. So into the Carboniferous, we start actually getting like true spiders, true scorpions, uh, Xyphosurans appear. Actually, uh, Xyphosurans appear one stage back, but uh, at the early uh, Carboniferous, we actually get members of Limulidae, the, the family of modern seahorses. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here, like Odonata, like we talked about before with the uh, damselflies and dragonflies. Yeah, horseshoe crabs. Um, Odonata, which is you know the group that includes dragonflies and damselflies, mm -hmm. they're evolving at this point. So it's we're getting really some of the first organisms that you might recognize in the Carboniferous, which is, I, I think that's kind of interesting. Because up until now, Earth would have been a very alien place if you visited. But starting right here, you'd recognize some things. It would still be mostly a very strange place to visit, but there would be some hints at familiarity, I think to some extent mm. for the first time. Yes. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, it's it's less alien <laughs> than than the Cambrian, certainly. Oh, much less. And you wouldn't really have found very many tall things at the end of the Silurian either, or by the end of the Silurian. So it's not really until you get into the Devonian where, yeah, you're starting to get like actual forests, but you know, no flowers certainly mm. by this time. Um, the this the pro gymnosperm so your your stem um cone bearing plants you know you wouldn't have any like pine trees or anything yet those are still a long ways off and you couldn't even get a christmas tree if you wanted to <laughs> yep no christmas trees uh no aracaria all those guys sorry not around yet so anyway uh i guess i'll take a second to just say uh hello to our chat, because I'm just now looking at it. So we got uh, Peter, of course, Bent Hoven, No Relation, Scott Duke, uh, Lordship Mayhem. Oh, we have a super chat from Vandalia. Thank you for four ninety nine. says, Dapper or Jackson, if you can get me the contact info for any student or professor of plant evolution, I'd appreciate it. I, I don't a... think I know any of those. I... I don't think yeah i don't think i know any either but i i did a plant evolution show on your peter is it not coming up i'm clicking on the thing i don't see it peter i'm clicking on it's not showing up it should come up doesn't it no i it am does. not seeing it it doesn't my fear has to do it let me try well, let me try a different one Okay. Nope, it's not working for that one either. Okay. Is, well, that I, I appreciate weird. that, Vandalia. I don't know what, what the issue is. Scott Duke. Oh, Icarus. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy well, to have all of you, as per always. Okay, well. Uh, at any rate, okay, uh, next slide, please. Ah, I figured it out. Okay. Uh, I'll I'll give you the next slide first. You figured out how to give me the next slide. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. Um, What's all this Mississippi and Pennsylvanian stuff there, uh, Jackson? Pay no attention to but the. Uh, I mean, to the, the geologic doesn't even have happen up here. What's going oh, on? Oh, I don't know. Americans are crazy. We all know this is true. It's not just America. It's North America specifically. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know, North America geology splits the Carboniferous up into the Mississippi and the Pennsylvanian for no really good reason. They just kind of nope. do. Um, it actually has to do with things like oil exploration and stuff like that. And yeah. for some reason that I don't fully understand, but I'm willing to just take the actual people in the field at their word. It's apparently easier to break it up into two periods for purposes of like fossil fuel exploration. So like 
hey, fine. But uh, yeah, for that reason, you'll sometimes see Mississippi and Pennsylvania, specifically about this period in North America. Yes. It's just, it'll come up in museums and textbooks. So now you just know what that is. Mississippi is the first part. Pennsylvania is the last part. There you go. Quite right. Exactly. Um, so um, there's an interesting little um, you know, correlation everyone's probably aware of, and that is uh, that uh, you know oxygen feeds into fire, right? So if you have higher levels of oxygen, you also get like higher incidence or you know increased like incidence of fire. And interestingly, during the Carboniferous, you get like continent-wide fires, like what happened in Australia two years ago. Crazy stuff. That was two years ago and not a decade ago. <laughs> I mean, technically, every year of of twenty twenty is is ten years. So yes, and we're currently in the the second. No, sorry, the third year of twenty twenty. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so right, the technically, sure. it's, it's been thirty or it's been twenty years since that happened. And all I'm help. starting to feel like the old lady at the end of Titanic. <laughs> I think you're prettier, but anyway. Well, thank you. Uh, so, so you get you can see the uh, the atmospheric oxygen uh, percent here, and so yeah, you get yeah widespread fires. Like you you find evidence of fire in the fossil record, right? That's how that's how widespread these fires were. It's pretty crazy. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was neat. Well, yeah, your, your high levels of oxygen also aren't just in the Carboniferous. They also go into the Permian and then sort of uh, drop down back kind of to, to modern levels uh, at the end of the Permian. So. There's actually something I want to point out here, and it's yeah. that some people have a confusion about this, and they seem to think that this high oxygenation extends through at least the Mesozoic. And that's not actually true. The Mesozoic oxygen levels did fluctuate but they were much closer to today's levels than they were to anything going on in the Carboniferous. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've heard some people say, well, you know, maybe sauropods couldn't survive today because of the low oxygen or pterosaurs couldn't fly today because of the low oxygen. That's, there's no good reason to think that because we have things like amber from the Mesozoic and it shows the oxygen level when you have little air bubbles in there. Mm -hmm. It's not significantly different than today for most of the Mesozoic. Yeah. So just yeah. uh, if you ever start to think to yourself, oh, yeah, at the time of the dinosaurs, there was lots more oxygen. No, you're thinking about significantly earlier than any dinosaur ever existed. Uh, isn't there who was wasn't there someone who proposed that, like, the oxygen levels had to be higher because otherwise, like, Brachiosaurus would, like, would start to it, breathe fire with its narrow yeah, nostrils. It yes, would, like, ignite actual thing. as a result. Yeah, good Lord. Yeah, it would have to breathe so hard that it would actually spontaneously ignite the flesh of its nostrils i which just no I, i'm not a physics person but you know dapper can you give like can you give us like a hint as to is that like anywhere near feasible no <laughs> no i mean okay even if it were the case the brachiosaurus couldn't survive in our current atmosphere we know what happens when people don't have when organisms don't have enough oxygen right they're not able to just breathe in so hard they cause fires <laughs> Like, come on. Uh, well, I, I speak for yourself. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, maybe you've got really, really strong high-speed lungs that could survive the rib-cracking forces that would be required <laughs> for you to move air that quickly. Right. Yeah, you're just, your lungs would, like, collapse or would yeah, pop, they, you know. There's Yeah, it's just, it's nonsense. Um, But hey, apparently that was an explanation as to why there are legends of fire-breathing dragons, because humans making up cool stuff, This that's not an adequate explanation. <laughs> Has to be a real animal that actually had its nostrils catch on fire. Which the thing I love most about those is like the same people who say that also are like, oh yeah, humans just make up stuff sometimes. It's like, okay, you can't have it both ways. It can't be like right? everything, everything ever drawn is real, and also sometimes people make stuff up. Like you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. It's no, it's stuff I like that's real. Other yeah, stuff is made up. I'm sorry, you're you're correct. Yeah. Good lord. <laughs> oh, anyways, next slide, please. Before you go to the next slide, can I say uh, I'm an amateur yes, amateur magician, and to see on that slide that m magic is about 320 million years old, that's actually kind of neat. Where are you looking? The chart on screen. 
You say magic? Yes. Look at look at the bottom of the screen. About three hundred and twenty million years ago, we had pen. I think teller came later. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, Peter. Alrighty. I hope you're proud of that one. <laughs> I I do dad jokes uh, in my free time. That's oh fair. no. There should be a, a picture up there. Where it be at? Did you actually accidentally like delete it from, from the I file? guess. I guess I did. Well guys, oh. a thing called Cordates existed. Trust us. Google it. Trust us, bro. <laughs> Go, yeah, just Google it. You know, type that into Google. I'm sure something will come up. I'm not saying it didn't exist. I'm just saying you should do your own research. They, they existed yeah. just before the invention of the camera, so that's why there's no picture. <laughs> I gotta say though, I do like the Sigillaria like like PS1 level CGI. Jackson, you know, if you need some good CGI uh carboniferous plants, you can talk to me. Peter, this doesn't make any sense because it I just looked, it's in my slideshow. Peter's unless computer I, must hate it. Unless I deleted it. I this before, is this is like the immediately one, before the one you sent me, so it's I, in my that doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know. Like, like, hold on. Let it's me probably my not screen. super important. No, everyone is going to die if they do not see okay. this. Fair enough. Well, I don't want anyone to die. <laughs> that would be Peter, unfortunate. Can you see my screen? No. Can you share my screen just for one sec? Oh. You can't share my screen? Okay. That's fine. No, no, because the, we, we don't have anything set up. It's fine. To, it's share, fine. to share a screen. It's all right. That's okay. All right. Well, uh, Sigillaria is a is a Leica fight. <clears throat> we talked about them in the previous episode. So, you know, as we said, then Leica fights today are all pretty small. But back in the Devonian and Carboniferous, they were very large. Uh, in well, real some life, of them were large. Uh, Leica fights weren't actually PlayStation One background assets. Just just to say, you're just gonna attack my pictures now, Dapper. You know how really... much time and effort I I put in to choosing these pictures. Uh, way more than you should have because you could have just been like, hey, Dapper, can you make a 3D sigil area? And I'd be like, yeah, send some references. And then like a day later, you'd have not necessarily photorealistic, but not far off either. Anyways, there were also early gymnosperms because you had your, your crown gymnosperms uh, appeared either at the end of the Devonian or in the Carboniferous. I don't quite remember which. Um, and you had guys like Cordaites and Utrechtia which are uh, examples of that. So, you know, people don't talk about plants enough. So here we are talking about plants. Now, was Utrechtia from the Netherlands? That is a good question. It is entirely possible. Okay. It's, it, it's it, would, it would refer to Utrecht. Possible. Yeah. That's what I thought. It, it certainly... It, I wouldn't be surprised... I it would is, not be it, surprised. It is a city in the Netherlands. Yeah. It is. In the center. Unless Dapper has anything to add, we can go to the next slide. Gymnosperme. <laughs> so, uh, let's manage a bit of phylogenetics. So, we have... So, this is, I guess, the, the second... The penultimate group of, of plants we will discuss in our series. Um, <clears throat> up to this point, we discussed. Well, it's we're still within the the embryophytes. So the first ones we talked about were the the hornworts, the liverworts, and the mosses. And then we discussed lycophytes and ferns, and now we are dealing with the seed plants. Right, uh, the ferns were the last clade of plants to reproduce via spores so nobody's reproducing with spores anymore the well that's not true the ones we aren't we're going to be talking about are not reproducing via spores okay that's true but you can't just the, say that no one's reproducing by spores anymore. nobody's ferns aren't real dapper i'm i I'm see them frankly incensed that you would say such a thing hold on let me push this Moss are plant, still real too this plant right next to me away let me hide this off screen <laughs> <laughs> um so at this point we have we've switched basically the very first plants we talked about the very first land plants 
were gametophyte dominant. They were doing most, if not all, of their photosynthesis in their gametophyte generation, quote, quote, um, which is their haploid stage. Whereas now, and then, you know, we went through <clears throat> the, the lycophytes and the ferns who were more um, or who are more sporophyte dominant, so more diploid. And now the gymnosperms, the cone bearing plants, and then the angiosperms, the flowering plants are almost entirely diploid. They're almost entirely in their sporophyte. So we've, we've gone, you know, pretty much completely away from the earlier mode of or their life you know lifestyle life cycle that was more in common with with algae the algal ancestors of plants and they're just becoming more and more derived in this you know this this life cycle method so the sporophyte is just reduced to a very very short stage or sorry the, the, the sorry the gametophyte is reduced to a very very short stage where they're just doing a cut you know a couple of divisions and then that's it that's all and you can see it right there. See male gametophyte, female gametophyte, and then that's, you know, they get fertilized, and that's it. They seed, and then we're back to the gametophyte. Or we're back to the sporophyte. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Um, so, um, so there's also um, this idea that um, flowers are are more successful the the angiosperms the flowering plants are more successful than the gymnosperms because oh they have flowers and they're you know they have pollinators well actually or and they can make fruits but in actuality gymnosperms can do all those things too they just do them differently not to the same extent right um gymnosperms have and you know still are pollinated or some of them are by certain arthropods for instance uh some gymnosperms make fruits of their own quote quote like you see the ginkgo below or the ginkgo there down in the bottom left they make their own so it's not just about you know can you make you know can you be pollinated or do you make fruits there's more to it than that and so this clade includes cycads ginkgos uh natalians and conifers and natalians are an interesting group oh and of course the the pinaceae the pine now, Natalians are interesting because it is not known uh, quite where they go. The thinking broadly is that they lean gymnosperms. But they also share some interesting characteristics with angiosperms. And so there's been a lot of back and forth uh, between, you know, between different groups of researchers over the years as to our Natalians actually gymnosperms or are they you know basally derived angiosperms maybe uh, just like the squid and the octopus that came from outer space entirely possible it's and at least as possible as it is for the squid and the octopus <laughs> that's true that is true i gotta give you that yeah um and so um the the other the interesting thing about Natalians is we have very few modern species, and so there's probably a bit of long branch traction going on, because like the next closest relatives of Natalians, whether they whether that actually is angiosperms or gymnosperms, are very distantly related, so that could also be part of the problem. But at any rate, I happen to uh, work. For a certain someone who falls on the Natalians are related to angiosperm side. But anyways. <laughs> uh, do you have anything to add, Dapper? Um, I just do like it that now we're getting to where you can get a Christmas tree. Yes. Because yes. I like I like to drag the, the soon-to-be corpse of a, a large plant into my house and decorate it with shiny bits. Well, I mean, you know, everyone... Uh, you know, women love getting flower genitals, or sorry, uh, angiosperm genitals. You know, for uh, for holidays and stuff. So you know, it's true. It is what it is. <laughs> um, next slide, please. I work with a guy actually who's uh, who's like, I don't understand why people like getting flowers. They're they're literally plant genitals. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but they're pretty. 
They are pretty, and they it's really nice when you put your face all in them and you know give them a sniff. So yeah, uh, it's not that weird. <laughs> so the amphibians. So the tetrapods um, appeared at the end of the Devonian, well, either mid mid to late Devonian, um, and then they underwent a radiation at the start of the Carboniferous, and so you get this big flowering of diversity at the start of the Carboniferous and sort of through most of the Carboniferous. And so you have guys like uh, Eogerinus, which it's very difficult to see, and I don't expect anyone to be able to see it, but Eogerinus was like eight feet long. It basically lived like a crocodile uh, in the Carboniferous, and there's a, a little picture uh, associated with it, but it's like light green. So like I said, very difficult to see. I don't blame you if you can't see it. Um, but yeah, that thing basically lived like a crocodile, which it, it's an amphibian. Right, there's nothing, there are no amphibians alive today that have that ecological niche. Um, you know, they may consume arthropods sort of like that, but none of them are long enough to, to have the, the crocodile, the ambush, you know, the, the shoreline ambush predator niche today. Uh, Ophiderpaton is actually, uh, <clears throat> Ophiderpaton is interesting because it is the first. Um, tetrapod to lose all of its limbs. Is that the earliest. we know of. That we know of, yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as we know, this is the earliest. And then Istopod. later... Yeah, you have the, the Istopods and... and um... See, there's a few ultimate life forms, things that anything, if given enough time, will evolve into. One of them is a crocodile, one of them is a snake, another one is a crab. Eventually, all yes. life forms will either go extinct, or all animals, I should say, will go extinct, or they will become one of those three things. <laughs> yep. And I say that because those things keep re-evolving over and over and over. Yeah, I really love the whole... Well, no, I get, we'll probably talk about it later. I was going to mention the phytosaurs and whether or not you know, they're Sukians or Pseudosuchia, and crocodiles are, are Sukians, but are actually Pseudosuchia. But anyways, we'll probably talk about that later. So In we'll come Mesozoic. back to that. Yep, in the Mesozoic. Uh, then Crisigerinus is just this cool little guy. Another uh, aquatic predator. Um, Eucrita, now I put him up there because he is actually what's... He's a member of the grade. It's not a clade, but they're called the Reptiliomorphs. They were the the amphibians, quote, quote, that were more closely... That are more closely related to the amniotes than to other amphibians. And so you That's crit assuming this amphibia is actually a clade. It might not be. Well, right. But, I mean, this guy, you know, he's he's um, following along that that um, group. There's also, like, Gephyrostega, or Gephyrostegus, which is another reptiliomorph. Um, and there are some others. Um, as, you, you know, we're sort of inching our way. We're getting closer and closer and closer towards the, the amniotes. So, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I have, um, I think that's it. Oh, I have a question. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, Eo uh -huh. Gyrinus. Yeah, Eo Gyrinus. Yeah. yeah. How how long was that? It's like uh, like eight feet long, something like that. If and, I and, correctly. And, and, and you said we don't have anything like that anymore. No uh, amphibians uh, like uh, that, except except for Cryptobranchidae, maybe. Except for what? Cryptobranchidae. They're not. They're not eight feet. They're. They're about six feet. We. We do have. I'm gonna have to look that up, Peter. I don't. You say the giant crypt? salamanders. It's a giant salamander in China. Okay, but they are not. They are. They are not. Um. They are not like giant ambush predators, right? I don't think they get, are they. Oh. It's well, more like five feet, and they're fully aquatic, so they're. Not generally jumping out of the water to grab things. Yeah. Also, um, <clears throat> don't we know of someone who was recently uh, convicted of a felony of illegally importing giant Chinese salamanders and killing a want, bunch of them? Do we want to name drop, or are we just saying we know a person? Because I know who you're talking about. It's up to you whether you not you want to name drop them. It's your channel. Uh well, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, we do happen to know someone who was recently convicted for that and also happen to have other animals you should not be having in your house venomous um, snakes like really venomous snakes like ludicrously venomous and temperamental snakes yeah so um 
you know, we're going to get on our soapbox for a moment here. Um, please don't order endangered species through the mail, please. You're you're not helping anyone, least of all the endangered species. Yeah. Um. So this person was almost certainly ordering these with the intent to sell at you know some local um herpetology thing. The thing is, he had a two-thirds death rate in his giant salamanders. This is a species that's critically endangered. It might not make it another decade total. Yeah. And just removing two, presumably from the sorry, three, presumably from the wild, only for two to die, and the third to almost certainly be taken out of the breeding pool anyway. Mm. Not if you care about the persistence of current biodiversity, it's not not a great thing to do. Also, it's really yeah. dumb because um, it's not that hard to track, and the feds really don't like it when you break their, you know, various <laughs> laws about importing, uh, you know, dangerous or endangered animals. Yeah, felonies are kind of a big deal. Yeah, that's uh, that is true. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, don't do that. If you if you do happen to know who it is, it's fine. If not, that's also fine. Uh, anyways, <laughs> um. Uh, all right. Next slide, please. Amniot evolution. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if I had a, a slide about it. Uh, so these, so what you're looking at here, uh, most of these guys, with the exception of like where it says amniota, these are all reptiliomorphs. You know, they're more closely related to the reptiles, quote, quote, which in you know, the ancestors of birds and mammals also, than they are to the true. Uh, amphibians, and so that's like I said, uh, Gephyrus stegus, uh, Solenodonsaurus, Samorium morpha. Uh, I think Diadectomorpha actually, uh, Diadectes was like one of the earliest or is the earliest known uh, herbivorous tetrapod, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that's kind of their claim to fame, but then like less Lithiana, little, small little guys. So just a, just a little assortment here. And I want to point out they look. It, visually speaking, it would be hard to tell them apart yes. as adults from the actual amniotes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, just look at these guys. They're all pretty similar overall. They're all sort of reptile-ish. Yeah, they right? all vaguely look kind of like a lizard. Yeah, it's yeah, Dapper's right. It's the things that I mean, like you know, as we talked about in in um, I think it was in the evolution the evolution process series. Like you have to go to school for many years. And then study these things like under a, you know, uh, I, under a microscope for some of them, or you got to stare at them for a very long time to figure out like, okay, the palette of you know this group is ever so slightly different from this other group, mm -hmm. or their vertebrae are slightly different, or their teeth, you know, arrangement or something like that. It's it's ever so different, and you have to be you know an expert in this to know the difference between them. So. Uh, we mentioned that with regard to horses and rhinos, because you you have to be an expert in in their their Molars. dental morphology yep. <laughs> to tell them apart at the earliest stages. So, yeah, everything's kind of vaguely lizardy at this stage. So, although lizards wouldn't evolve until much later. Correct, lizard sensu stricto, you know, the the subset of lepidosaurs would not come around until way later in the Triassic. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, here we are. Uh, crown amniota. So, I guess now's a good time to talk about this. Uh, yeah, I have it on the slide there. Uh, so traditionally, and even in some, you know, relatively recent books, um, the way that amniotes are or were divided was based on a morphological character called uh, temporal fenestra. And so this is little, uh, like, one or two little holes at the back of the skull, which were, like, providing a, a site of, of jaw muscle attachment. And what, and for a long time, the thinking was, okay, you have anapsids, which have no temporal fenestra, and that includes the turtles. Then you have the synapsids, so the mammals and the mammal-like reptiles, or reptile-like mammals, whichever one you want to go with. And then the diapsids, which is pretty much everybody else. Uh, you know, lizards and snakes, which are just legless lizards, uh, crocodilians, dinosaurs, birds. Those are all the absence. Well, and stem birds like pterosaurs. 
And so it turned out that this isn't quite correct. Um, I mean, uh, Synapsida is still just the mammals and mammal-like reptiles, uh, although there has been a bit of flip-flopping towards the base of the synapsid tree with diapsids, because, of course, that's kind of what you expect. They're so similar that they're flip-flopping back and forth. Um, uh, I think, was it Varanopidae, which is like one of those little uh, yeah, stem... I think currently, this consensus just started Synap to go a little bit closer to it being diapsid rather than synapsid. Right, right. Yeah, it's like, I, you know, they're so similar... Um, uh, like I said, you have to be an expert to figure out the difference. Um, well, and it also turns out anapsids are not like basally derived with respect to both synapsids and diapsids. Actually, the anapsids arise from within uh, uh, diapsida in a sense. Uh, you can see it there. It says, uh, the purple is diapsida. And so parareptilia corresponds approximately with anapsida. But also uh, turtles are no longer in that group. As it happens, turtles are within Neodiapsida, not within Parareptilia. So, um, so yeah. So there's there's been a bit of of um, systematic change going on there, which happens as we find more fossils and you know more transitional forms and genetic data comes out and all that fun stuff. Would you like to add anything? Um. No, I think the only thing I was planning on adding was that uh, turtles are weird now. They are very weird. Turtles are the only uh, tetrapods that have their shoulder girdle in their rib cage. That's true. Uh, which is extremely bizarre. Yeah, it uh, takes a little bit of uh, like gymnastic shuffling in embryo to get the the bones in there. It's kind of weird. Um, I was reading uh, Rudolf Raff's book. Um, uh, the shape of life and he points out that um if we didn't have turtles you know the argument would be it's impossible for your shoulder girdle to be inside of your rib cage and that's what everyone would say but since turtles exist we know that's not the case and it just kind of makes you wonder about the 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 biomechanics of other you know potential evolutionary structures Anyway, next slide, please. Alrighty, so here we have, you know, instead of just the skulls, which all look pretty similar to each other, you have these these uh, little artistic reconstructions, which also, I mean, they all look sort of lizardy, <clears throat> right? You yes. Have the para, para reptile, para, para reptile uh, representative, which is Hylonomus, that little guy on the top left, then Petrolacosaurus on the bottom left and then archaeothyrus which is a basal synapsid on the right and you know these guys uh the the uh, origin of amniota was like what 320 million years ago so getting down sort of towards the end of the carboniferous and as you know as we've said over and over again when you get back to this to the the meeting point between different clades they look pretty similar if not identical because that's precisely what is expected under evolution is two organisms get more similar the further you go back in time two lineages i should say so anything you'd like to add um not really i just think it's interesting that like really all throughout the sort of tree of life you see the same pattern where as you go back in time the earliest members of what we now think of as very dis different groups mm -hmm. look virtually identical because you got to remember Bottom left is a member of the same group as, you know, like a hummingbird. Mm -hmm. yes. On the right, yeah. we have a member of the same group as the elephant. Right. Which, yeah. Kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, come a long way. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next slide, please. And so, so you had the, um, as I said, the carboniferous rainforest collapse at the end of the carboniferous and so the a lot of the larger amphibians kind of get wiped out by that event which leaves open their ecological niches for the amniotes which recently uh, evolved and now the amniotes can evolve to fill in those niches whether they're predators or herbivores or you know omnivores what have you so 
That brings us to the start of the Permian. So the Permian is the final period of the Paleozoic. A lot of alliteration there. And it lasted from about 299 to 252 million years ago. And as I just said, the amniotes filled the niches left by the amphibians, leading to large herbivores and carnivores. We're seeing the very first large amniotes, but certainly not the last ones. And you can see Pangaea is over there on the bottom right. And then those are either Dimetrodon or some other closely related Pelicosaur. It looks like Dimetrodon Grandis. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, look, all of my plants are here this time. So that's nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess I'll, I'll pick a, a Ligocarpia first over in the top right. So that is a fern relative. <clears throat> Whereas the other guys, Glossopterus and Gigantop. Gigantopteris, Gigantoteris, however you pronounce it. I don't know whether the P is silent or not. Uh, but those. You know are... what? It is what you want it to be. I mean, that's fair. That's. There's, that's... Look, it's from ancient Greek, but no ancient Greeks are going to come by and, like, you know, whack you with a stick for pronouncing ancient Greek things wrong in English. At least until Bill and Ted bring back Socrates. Well, yeah. Well, when they bring back Socrates, he can first whack them on the head for getting Socrates <laughs> wrong. And then they'll come and find you, I, I'm sure. <laughs> and like his ears are like, you know, spider sense. And he's like, ah, I hear <laughs> Greek being pronounced incorrectly. <laughs> Personally, I say we start saying words like tentacles as if they were Greek names. Tentacles? Tentacles, yeah. Tentacles Tentac or tentacles? Tentacles. Tentacles. <laughs> This is my my old friend Tentacle. <laughs> <laughs> why not, right? I, why not? Yeah. Um. So Glossopterus and Gigantopterus. That's how we're going to pronounce it today. Uh, botanists come at me. Uh, are actually early relatives of angiosperms, and this is very interesting because, well, they are hypothesized to be relatives of angiosperms because the first angiosperms, well. Thanks to a recent paper, um, now they are known from the Middle Jurassic, the earliest ones. But for the longest time, the earliest uh, angiosperms were appearing in the early Cretaceous, and they were just kind of all already there. Like the Magnoliids, uh, the Eudicots, and the Monocots were all just kind of like, whoop, there they are. Um, and so, you know, Darwin called that the abominable mystery. Like, oh, where did flowers come from? You got. You know, everybody else is, is kind of showing up gradually in the fossil record. Like, yeah, you got some early ferns. You got some early gymnosperms. They just kind of got flowers. They just kind of come out. Well, and you know, I think we talk about flower reproduction in a moment. But, or, or sorry, we talk about flower reproduction way later. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, Are we going to talk about Archifructus? I think so. Like nice. I, 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 probably. I believe so. But, um, so Glossopterus... And Gigantopterus, these guys are from the Permian, and they are stem angiosperms, you know, way, way removed from our modern angiosperms, but they're early members of, like, moving towards that direction. And so, um, so very first approaches at our flowering plants, although we won't meet our actual flowering plants until a long time from now. In the Cretaceous. Yeah, we still got like 200 million years till we meet them. Yeah, it's going to be so another episode. <laughs> I mean, actually, yeah, it is true. So. That we're going to get to the Cretaceous today. No, probably not. We're not even out of the Permian yet. Yeah. Um, anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I don't think I have a whole lot of Permian flora. Sorry. <laughs> not much. Get it of a together, botany. Dapper. I know. I know. I should just go take a, a whole course on paleobotany. I mean, that would be cool. I would be definitely down for that. I don't know if I'm actually up for that. You can go for it. Fair enough. All right. Next Take slide, it for please. both of us. <laughs> I'll tell you how it went. <laughs> okay. Good. Next slide, please. There we are, amphibians. All right. So now we're dealing with Permian amphibians. So, you know, there were still um, big am amphibians out there in the Permian. They just didn't have quite the diversity they did in the Carboniferous. So you have Diplocolis, which is the guy with the weird boomerang-shaped head over in the top left. Weird guy. Which, by the way, um, 
current trends in reconstruction actually have the boomerang head not being completely separate from the body, but there being like ah flesh covering that goes all the way back. But that's yeah. also speculative. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we don't really know, but that seems like that might have had a bit more like hydrodynamic like yeah. soundness. So like that's one of the thinkings there. So nowadays you might see some Diplocalus uh, reconstructions like that, especially if they're newer. Um, hmm. But again, it's speculative. And if you decide that you want to do a reconstruction of Diplocalus and you don't want to do that, I can't, as far as I know, say that you're wrong. So, I mean, that would certainly make sense with the the skin, like like a little, you know, little flap of skin connecting, yeah, to the neck from the from those those like protrusions. That would make sense. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, <clears throat> neither also, would honestly surprise me. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, nature is weird. We talked about <laughs> bee orchids, you know, in the evolution process video. So, yeah, nature is very strange. Uh, Peltobotrachus is like a terrestrial or was a terrestrial amphibian that was like armored. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Baggy Herpeton, however you pronounce that, I have no idea, was also sort of like a, a crocodilian, even sort of like a gario like with that snout. You know, very strange. See, everything evolves into a <laughs> crocodile, a snake, or a crab. True. Only and then Platyhistrix is interesting because uh, he's kind of like a, a little Dimetrodon is kind of how he looks, you know, got that that um, uh, thermoregulatory sail on his back. Um, that sail actually evolved a whole bunch of times or, or yep. in tetrapods. Uh, so they're I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Dapper. Oh, so the sail back is a, an extension of the neural spines. So if you look at the vertebrae of um, at least amniotes, this amphibians get a little weird and simplified vertebrae, so we'll just stick to amniotes. One of the big things that there's this thing called a neural process or a neural spine that's on the um, dorsal side of the vertebra. And these things vary in extent. And in a lot of animals, they're just used to attach various back muscles. That's what you use them for. And that's, I don't, as far as I know, all animals do attach um, muscles there. But some animals, like our Platyhistrix and later our Demet Demetrodon and Adathosaurus and then Spinosaurus, all, all sorts of animals, uh, they've extended these for various reasons. We're not sure what all of the reasons are because currently there really aren't any animals like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it happens several times. It's not even clear if it's always for the same reason. Mm -hmm. But one of the big, two of the biggest um, options that have been given are thermoregulation and display. So yeah. for thermoregulation, the idea is this vastly increases your uh, surface area, which means you have a big area to either um, take in heat by turning it towards the sun or give off heat by either going into shade or just turning it so that it's only edge onto the sun so the sides can both radiate heat away. That's one option. Another option is, like I said, display, where there might have been some kind of marking or an ability to flush the area with blood to increase the redness of the area and that could have been done for things like uh, sexual competition um mm -hmm. territorial threat displays all sorts of things like that and it could also just be a combination right like maybe um yeah, absolutely a thermal regulatory structure also comes in handy for threat displays because it makes your silhouette look bigger and so there's like, two reasons to be selected for like maybe in birds for instance yeah you know? So with feathers, which are both thermoregulatory, well, actually they're thermoregulatory, aerodynamic, and display structures in most species of birds. Yeah. Also, which is triple duty. I don't, I don't think I heard. Maybe you did. Um, there was also a crocodilian which evolved a sail sailfin. Also, it's called Arizonasaurus. Pseudosuchian. Pseudosuchian. Yeah. Not um, an actual crocodilian. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a pseudosuchian who who developed it. Who you know? So amphibian. Pelicosaurs, uh, Pseudosuchian, a couple different dinosaurs, so like Aranosaurus, uh, which was an, an herbivore, uh, and a Spinosaurus. So yeah, it evolved a whole bunch of times, very interestingly. Yeah. It's kind of like saber teeth. Those have also evolved several times independently. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I think marsupials had them. Uh, Once in the, the Permian. Yeah, the Gorgon options. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Parareptilia, so um, our guys were sister to the neodiapsids. So the thinking was originally that turtles came out of the parareptilia group, either being uh, uh, closely related to or falling within the, the pariasaurs or the procolophonoids. But neither turned out to be true. 
as turtles are in fact neodiapsids and are um, they're they're in fact um, related to the archosaurs if I remember correctly they're like you got, yeah the genetics uh, seem to be falling out that they're basically like archosauromorphs essentially yeah yeah they're sister to the crocodile bird clade they're just they're the next group interestingly um so milleretta uh mesosaurs um uh, mesosaurus was actually one of the fossils that helped uh, alfred wegner figure out that pangaea was a thing because he found that these fossils distributed across uh, different continents separated by an ocean and he's like huh that's weird i wonder if these continents were you know maybe like pushed together at some point in the past and these organisms could say traverse these and I mean, he was broadly correct. That is, in fact, the case. But uh, he didn't have a mechanism for it. So, and we talked. I believe we talked about that in a previous episode. Um, the Periosaurs. We did uh, actually. Yeah, we did. We talked about the fact that biogeography was the thing that hmm. got people to figure out Pangaea, and we had a slide for it. It was in the evolution, uh, like the process yes. of evolution series. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Periosaurs were also like big herbivores. They were, uh, some of them had like armor scoots and stuff, which is kind of neat. Uh, and then the Procolophon. Procolophon. Yeah, that's how we're going to pronounce that right now. <laughs> Another kind of small lizard like guy was also, I think they have like broadened ribs, which is part of the reason why researchers thought maybe they were related to turtles. But as I said, nope, not really. Get wrecked, uh, Procolophon. <laughs> Idiot. Way to not evolve into turtles. Yeah, way to leave no genetic legacy, you fools. Unbelievable. Um, next slide, please. Ah, now here we are, the Neodiapsida. Um, so just you know, a smattering of different Parmian Neodiapsids. Uh, you're going to... Hovasaurus and Thaddeosaurus, which I believe are both like semi-aquatic, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Celerosaur Avis is weird. Uh, he's, a, he's a strange little guy. He had these these flaps of skin on his sides, which you know he used to uh, to glide from tree to tree. So similar to the current lizard species or gen genus Draco, yeah, which use actually like weird extendable ribs. To yeah, that's attach weird. flight mem well gliding membranes. They need to stay. stop that immediately. Um, you know what? That's a that's a, a lesser priority for me than the pelagic tunicates. <laughs> pelagic tunicates, no. Draco, okay, probably not. But like, we'll deal with you after. Okay, what about like the gliding snakes? No, nah, I don't mind. I don't care. That's fine. You don't care about gliding? No, no, that's they're, a definite. They're just that's... flat. That's it. They're just flat. They're just flat snakes. I do not want a snake to jump out of a tree. And like, no, absolutely Snakes not. Snakes have been jumping out of trees for millions of years, Jackson. No. It's not going to stop now. Turn down all the trees. All right. Fair I enough. mean, cyanobacteria is doing all the work of like putting out oxygen anyways. Let's be real. Well, they're not doing all the work of sequestering carbon. <laughs> That's true. That is true. What if we could like invent a pole <laughs> that takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts O2 back into it? What if we could do that? Uh, that would be amazing. <laughs> just a big tall. What if it actually could just make more of itself? What if it could like provide shade too? That'd be kind of neat. Well, know? I think just being a pole means it's going to provide shade. I, I mean, like a tiny bit of shade, you know, not necessarily like a, a large amount like of shade. A bunch more? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we could use some kind of broad branching structures that will use uh, some kind of like <laughs> photon energy to I power some kind of process that will help them sequester this carbon and that will itself provide yeah. additional shade. I feel like. Yeah, but like if, if it's branching, you know, obviously like the middle of the pole couldn't do that. So we'd probably have to make like these little, you know, sort of these structures that have like, uh, you know, a surface area uh, and are on these branches, which are themselves, you know, doing that that photon harvesting process. I don't know. Just a thought. We're just throwing I'm things gonna, out there right now. I'm going to call it the hypercarbon tube. <laughs> It's a brand yeah. new thing. I'm going to pitch it to Elon Musk once he has a <laughs> once he has a um, like a press release. Then everyone will love it. Everyone will wonder when they're coming out. Then mm -hmm. there will be a Thunderfoot video where he just points out that that's just a tree, <laughs> and then everyone will say Thunderfoot's just crazy because that can't just be a tree. It's a hypercarbon tube. It's way better. 
And then, surprise, surprise, Elon Musk will never actually build a single carbon hypertube. Or hypercarbon tube, sorry. Didn't he do that for... So many things. Was it like uh, the solar electric truck? Roads? Wasn't that a thing? So, uh, he wasn't doing solar roads, but another group was. <laughs> and the same thing happened to them. But he also, like... Remember SpaceX reusing their fully reusable rockets by like 2016 or something? Yeah, still not done. Uh, he was going to get us to, he was going to be on Mars by this year, not even close. Tesla truck was going to be delivered by like 2018. Not a single one has been produced. Uh, oh, solar, okay, his solar roof thing was going to be in production the year it was announced. It's currently like five years after, not a single one. We are Elon get, Musk is just a scammer. We, we are going to get so many hate comments now. Thanks, Dapper. Bring it. <laughs> Bring it. I hate Elon Musk uh, so much, man. I mean, yeah, no, he's, you know, whatever um, whatever intelligence he has, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, he says a lot of dumb stuff. His intelligence is almost entirely towards hyping up himself and his companies in order yeah. to drive up their stock prices so that when he realizes they're about to go under, he can jump ship. He's done it numerous times. Also, yeah. the car he shot into space. That car, according to contract, belonged to the actual founder of Tesla, not him. He stole that car. Yeah. Oop. Stole someone else's car to launch it into space. If we ever get into like a, a Horizon Zero Dawn situation, Musk is definitely going to be Ted Farrow. <laughs> like, no question. That's how that's going to happen. Uh, all right, next slide, please. Now that we just went on a random anti-Musk uh, tirade. Uh, hey, look, saber teeth. Yeah. All right. Ooh, look at that. Uh, synapse. So these are our relatives now. We're finally on our side of the, you know, the reptilian family tree. So uh, that's Edaphosaur. So the most basally derived member on this chart is, or on this slide is, is Edaphosaurus, mm. uh, which I believe was herbivorous, wasn't he? Yes, Edaphosaurus um, is herbivorous. The other... Uh, Sphenacodon that people tend to remember is uh, Dimetrodon, which was carnivorous. Right. Yep. Um, and then Gorgonops was very likely carnivorous. <laughs> Given that um, it had big old, uh, big old saber teeth, so very yeah. likely. Uh, it's also a therapsid, which is it's one of the I think two therapsid, two therapsids up here, if I remember correctly, because I don't think dinosaurians were therapsids. Um, I think you're right. I think you're right. So that. we're getting actually with, um, actually, was were Dysonodons therapsids? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. And then. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> with those two, we're actually getting fairly close to mammals, and we. So a lot of the things that we now think of as distinctive mammal traits, like fur and milk, we don't really know when they would have evolved because those are things mm. that tend not to. Um, not to fossilize well. Now, we do actually have some fairly early Permian um, uh, coprolites, which contain yeah. hair. So something was furry around this time. We don't know what. Uh, we don't know how widespread that was. But it's entirely possible that even Dicynodon and Gorgonops should actually be fully furry. And we can't, it's not likely, but we can't even rule out that they had some kind of milk-like secretion that they fed their young. Right. They definitely weren't giving live birth, though. They were right. very, very confidently egg layers. But we're still, we're getting into that mammal territory where, like, even if you look at their skeletons, you look at them, and you're like, that almost looks like a mammal. But there are still some big differences. One of them being um, the dorsal oh, the vertebrae. Yeah. The jaw structure is very different. So both of these have the sort of um, primitive amniote, or actually tetrapod jaw, where they mm -hmm. have, you know, the... The dentary on the lower jaw then connects to the angular and serangular and a little articular bone in the back. And then that goes up and connects to a muscle that attaches at the quadrate. And that's their um, main you know, jaw opening connection there. And then they have uh, muscles that go through the temporal fenestra down onto the jaw to pull, to pull the jaw up for bite force. But um, And they also have uh, a rib arrangement that is still very primitive. So most uh, tetrapods have ribs that go all the way down to the sacrum. And so those are called dorsal ribs. Um, you might be familiar yourself with the difference between thoracic vertebrae and lumbar vertebrae. In mammals, thoracic vertebrae are the ones that have associated ribs and the lumbar vertebrae don't. And that distinction is something that comes up 
later in the lineage of mammals. But at this point, these animals still have just dorsal vertebrae that go all the way back to the sacrum. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yes, quite so. Uh, Estaminosuchus is the dinocephalian that uh, Dapper mentioned. And uh, he's a cool guy. I like his, his whatever's going on on his head is pretty neat. Probably something for uh, display. It's like a hippo with weirdo horns. Yeah. He's a weird guy. Um, I also like Dicynodons because as far as I know, they're the only synapsids that ever bothered <clears throat> with a beak. Which I is think weird. you're right. Yeah, I believe you're correct. They're weird guys. Because um, actually someone asked me, like, how come beaks never really seem to appear outside of like reptiles? And I was like, well, I mean, there's Dicynodons, so... You know, yeah, they had beaks. They count. They were real. Dinosaur yeah, dogs were yeah. valid, guys. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> they are. They're very valid here. We we respect mm -hmm. them. But yeah, so like also, some of the most successful land animals to ever exist. We'll talk about yes. in the Triassic though a little bit more. Yeah, I think yeah we kind of they they some might say they straggle the boundary between the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. Oh, they definitely do. But when we get uh, to Triassic, we'll talk more about the Cynodonts that were in the Triassic. Quite right. Um, so, as uh, I mentioned, we have the Therapsids, and then we're getting uh, rather close to the Mammalia forms. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have a, a phylogeny. Um, so we actually... Sorry, I was wrong. Dinocephalian does fall within Therapsida. I was wrong. Uh, um, there you go. All right. It's, but yes. As we've talked about earlier, a lot of these things look very similar, and I can't always remember exactly who goes into yeah. which little subclade of Synapsida. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you, yeah, we, yeah, the Cassius, oh yeah, the Cassius swords, they're like a, a group of herbivores. Um, they're just kind of a little out there group. Um, and then you have your. Uh, your Pelicosaurus, which is a grade, not hey, a clade. Don't just skip over Chiasauria, because they had the amazing Cotillorhynchus, which had the tiniest little head on a gigantic <laughs> body, and it was amazing and adorable, and I love Cotillorhynchus. It's... So you can't just skip over them like there's just some weird group. Well, they were, uh... <laughs> but they were also amazing. I mean, if you haven't seen uh, Cotillorhynchus, um, you need to. You're missing out on life. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, the Ark Encounter actually has a really good Cotilla Rinkus. When they go out of business, and uh, right before they become a strip club, we need to like rescue all their really nice um, like paleo art. Right? Some, they actually yeah. have some pretty good stuff in there. It's, it's kind of impressive. I mean, it's depressingly <laughs> impressive, but... Yeah, they also have like a, a nice... Um, like a, a, a sort of proto-giraffe, don't they? Yeah, they have some kind of like like um short necked giraffe thing that's supposed to look like the common ancestor of the giraffes and the oak copies. Mm -hmm. Right. I think they also have something that's supposed to that's supposed to be similar to like Hyracotherium. So yeah, yeah, it's it's it is sad that that the, the Ark Encounter of all places has like some pretty spectacular paleo art. <laughs> Until you get to Australopithecus, then it kind of falls off the rails for some weird reason. Yeah. Crazy, wild mm. stuff. Also, um, I don't think they address the fact that giraffoidia is a thing. Because as far as I know, I don't think they actually have an antelocaprid model. But I might be wrong about that. I haven't been there. I just haven't seen anything to indicate they have an um, antelocaprid. They're too cowardly to admit that antelocaprids exist. Uh, well, based on what Kurt Wise said in a video, I believe that that's true, yeah. Because <laughs> apparently I'm a coward for thinking that giraffoidia is a thing and that maybe antelocaprid is a valid taxon like you get like the side eye from from a pronghorn you know <laughs> um dapper mentioned uh moments ago oh well first we fall within the clade synodontia so there's like synapsids then the therapsida is within that clade and then within the therapsids we fall within synodontia and so and then within mammalia formies and then within actual mammalia which we'll get to later because there are no true mammals yet. Uh, Dapper mentioned the, the fact that the jaw joint uh, is different for the earliest uh, synapsids. So they have the, the your sort of standard tetrapod jaw joint, which um, gradually 
uh, evolves over time until we get our modern mammalian jaw joint. So you can see you have your quadrate articular joint only, which is the standard tetrapod uh, joint. Then you get your your articular quadrate joint and your dentary squamosal joints. And, and you... I got to quickly point out that um, I have seen someone claim that propanagnathus didn't have molars. You can probably see on this picture that it did. <laughs> But also, this yeah. person put up pictures of probanagnathus molars while making this claim. It's, so there's some weird uh, stuff going on there about probanagnathus. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know who decided to pick on probanagnathus. But, um, yeah. The, it's a weird world out there. It is a strange world, got to admit. Um, probanagnathus, fun fact, was its existence was predicted decades before it was discovered. Uh, mm -hmm. Because... Uh, evolutionary biologists and paleontologists were like, hey, uh, if this is the way modern mammals have a jaw joint and we got these, you know, they're, they're descended from you know, reptiles, then they should have gone through a very particular um, jaw maneuvering. And then, oh, hey, probating nathus, that's a thing. And it has the jaw joint predicted by paleontologists. How funny is that? Yeah, and uh, no competing ideas have uh, managed to have that kind of predictive power when it comes to the fossil record. Nope. Not Many of them can one. accommodate things, but that's yep. not good enough. Nope. There are no, or no, none of them are able to predict fossils in advance. So, uh, next slide, please. All right. And here we are. The great dying. Yep, and then we'll move on to the Mesozoic. Da, da, da. Hooray! Um, so the Permian Extinction. So uh, the Permian Extinction, in case you are unaware, uh, was the largest extinction event in the Phanerozoic. Um, it's it pretty bad. bonkers how many organisms it killed off. Pretty bonkers. Um, <clears throat> so... It yeah, it resulted from yeah, volcanic activity at the Siberian traps as well as methane output from microbes. And it killed 81 81% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrate species. So that's, that's so crazy. So out of every 10, you know, just like make a list of, of 10 vertebrates that you know of. Strike out seven of them. Think about that. That's insane. And you know, and then eight for marine organisms right if you if you want to if you play dungeons and dragons and you want to think about how it would be to be a terrestrial vertebrate imagine that you now need to take a constitution save or die immediately and you need to roll a 14 or higher to do it <laughs> it's not not going to be a great time yeah i mean sure you could do it but like not a fun time to bet your entire existence on that roll of a 14 or higher yeah and uh, as, as Dapper mentioned previously, Dicynodonts were uh, extraordinarily um, successful in this time period. And Lystrosaurus was the most successful species. In fact, in some, uh, in some fossil sites that span the Permian-Triassic boundary, Lystrosaurus makes up like 90% of the fossils. Yeah, it's estimated that at the beginning of the um, Triassic, something like... 60 plus percent of the land of the mass of land tetrapods was dicynodonts mostly lystrosaurus at first then they there was a bit of a radiation during the early triassic mm -hmm. and then for some reason during the triassic they just all go away bye yeah yep yeah and so uh the, if you ever read the book the evolution underground by um oh I'm drawing a blank on his name um Anyway, I said the book name, The Evolution Underground, so look that up. Uh, the the guy who wrote it, he writes like a whole fan fiction story about Lystrosaurus surviving the Permian Triassic mass extinction. Nice. It's it's very interesting. Anthony Martin, that's his name. He's a paleontologist, I believe. Um, yep. Hello, everybody. In the side chat, Cody Larynchus looks funny. Yes, it does. Uh, it's because Cotolorhynchus is the best. Um, that guy, that uh, upturned shark-looking guy, is not actually a shark. In the picture on the right, that is a a chimera relative, which is you know elasmobranch. 
right? But uh, not a, or sorry, it is a Chondrichthian, but it's not a shark. Uh, so that's uh, Helicoprion. He's got that weird little tooth whirl on the bottom jaw. Very strange. And those are some ammonites. Uh, That's before Evanites, even my time, so I don't know what the deal is with that. Evanites went extinct in the at, at that extinction, didn't they? I know trilobites um, did. Trilobites definitely did. I don't think ammonites did. I thought ammonites okay. were. Then what were the big shelly boys during the? Uh, no, I guess the you're Mesozoic. right. Yeah, because yeah, they were all right. over the place. That yeah, was like trilobites. Mosasaurus's favorite little snack. Um, yeah, trilobites went extinct. Um, did orthocones they, go extinct during the program? maybe it's orthocones I'm thinking of maybe that's what I'm thinking of um, and there's there are also cephalopods for anyone who's not aware they have these long conical shells um, that's but, why they're uh, called orthocones because they have straight cone shells which is yeah. literally what orthocone means in Greek it means straight cone a wild world in which we live it's almost like scientists use words that mean the thing that they're describing <laughs> what you're trying to be accurate and precise with your words that doesn't sound right unacceptable i mean sometimes they fail big. like phytosaurus <laughs> yeah we'll talk about that and that was a pretty big fail in the naming department but you know well is it based on the shape of their teeth or what um i think it was actually based on like post cranial elements that were discovered first but i'm not super like confident in my memory of like the history of phytosaur like gotcha uh science gotcha um but yeah no definitely not leaf eaters certainly mm -hmm. by any means um so, uh, so yeah. So the uh, well, interestingly, the the uh, the trilobites were kind of already on their way out by the end of the Permian. Um, they it certainly dropped a lot of their diversity, and I believe they were down to one family by the end of the Permian. Oh, possibly. Um, the, by contrast, interestingly, uh, crustaceans had increased in their diversity throughout the Paleozoic, so including insects. Did. So uh, I should have I should have said uh, marine crustaceans, I believe. Well, um, I mean, insects were also doing all sorts of cool stuff. Insects were doing lots of cool stuff. They're very true. Um, but uh, I there it's not known if the if there's causation between the increase in marine crustaceans and the decrease in trilobites or it's just, you know, that just happened entirely possible. Um, it's just an interesting little trend that occurred. Uh, anything you'd like to add? No, I think we covered it. And thus wraps up the the Paleozoic. Hooray! And now we move on to the Mesozoic. Da, da, da. And now, which of course folks, is the best of the Zoics. Absolutely. So now, folks, I hand things over to Dapper, and I'll be the one to say, "I think you covered that quite well." So take All it right. away. Well, let's. Go on to the first slide that has the content on it. All right, so the Triassic is the first uh, period of the Mesozoic. It's also probably the weirdest. Uh, it was from 252 to 201 million years ago. So at the end of the Permian, like we said, we had basically everything go extinct. Up until this time, um, synapsids were sort of the dominant land tetrapods. And at least in terms of herbivores, they did remain that for the earliest part of the uh, Triassic. But as it says here, diapsids radiated into the niches left open by the Permian-Triassic extinction, including pseudosuchians, which are all those archosaurs that are closer to crocodiles than they are to birds, pterosaurs, who are stem birds, ichthyosaurs, who are actually close, more closely related to lizards than they are to dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, who are actually more closely related to turtles than they are to dinosaurs or lizards, and of course, the actual dinosaurs. <clears throat> so at this point, dinosaurs being sort of the stars of the Mesozoic for the most part, were still, like it says, predominantly small with the exception of prosauropods or the pre-sauropods. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. At the time, the really big heavy hitters were primarily pseudosuchians. Um, so if you were to drop yourself down in a you know little time machine into the Triassic, the big lumbering, even two-legged bitey things that you're seeing are primarily pseudosuchians. There would have been some dinosauromorphs running around, but uh, for the most part, what you would have seen, especially early on, would be a lot of uh, dicynodonts and a lot of pseudosuchians. 
And then later on, as you go further into the Triassic, the Dicynodonts start to get replaced by Pseudosuchian herbivores. Uh, so let's get the next next slide, please. <clears throat> oh, unless, uh, uh, Jackson, you had anything. Uh, I think you covered that quite well. Thank you. Thank you. So this is also where we start getting the first things that if you looked at them, you'd probably think it was a mammal, even though technically we're not quite there yet. Um, so we have a few clades of the synapsids that survived after Permian uh, Triassic extinction, the cynodonts and the diacynodonts. Now, the names are similar, but the animals aren't that closely related. They're both in Therapsida, but, you know. Um, so the diacynodont we have uh, with Placerius here, which is on the bottom right. Uh, Placerius, like we talked about earlier, ended up making up a huge proportion of the mass of land uh, tetrapods. They were everywhere. They were thick on the ground. Um, they were by far the most common uh, land animal that we have in a lot of fossil beds from this period. We also have um, Bonus Cynodon, which is a very, we're getting really close to mammals here. And um, Har if I can say it, Haramia via is what I'm going to go with. Uh, one of the things that you can see here is some very specialized dentition going on. So we have some molars that are uh, these little short sort of triangle shaped pointy molars that are really good for snacking on insects. We have little incisors that are good for snatching at things. And uh, this is sort of setting up the idea that the mammal relatives at this time and for quite a while going forward are primarily small insectivores uh, who have, or primarily nocturnal we think, and they're starting to get extremely specialized dentition. So if you go back earlier in Therapsida and you look at say earlier cynodonts and other therapsids that still do have specialized dentition like the Gorgonopsids, there's less variation in tooth shape. Like yes, Gorgonopsids had molar-ish things and they basically had incisor reformed teeth and they had what looked like canines, but they were significantly less differentiated than we're getting uh, at this point in mammal lines. So let's go on, unless Jackson has anything. Oh, sounds good to me. All right, let's head on through. So, so Ichthyosauromorpha are a group of lepidosaurs, which means they're closer to lizards than they are to dinosaurs or turtles. And so for a while, we didn't actually have any great like early ichthyosaur type things. And so um, famously, ichthyosaurs were some of the first fossils ever really described. Um, Mary Anning found a number of very good specimens. If you don't know who Mary Anning is, um, what are you doing with your life? You should find out who she is. She uh, is, she I was extremely she, important to the, oh, sorry, go ahead. You might say she sells seashells down by the seashore. Yes, that, that little rhyme there is actually about Mary Anning. Um, she was an extremely prolific fossil hunter and paleontologist in her time. However, unfortunately, because it was like, you know, the mid 19th century, no one ever referenced her or anything, even though all sorts of people were consulting with her all the time. They never mentioned her in, you know, their various papers or books that they were publishing because she's just a woman and a commoner at that. I mean, you think you're going to let a common woman into the <laughs> royal society? Uh, the, no. No we, no women are allowed with the he-man woman haters? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and especially no commoner women. I mean, if the queen wants to come by, then whatever. But, you know, someone of poor breeding, unacceptable. <laughs> Um, so here we have some some examples. Uh, we have Hepasuchus, which is a fairly uh, basal member. Uh, one of the reasons you can tell is that its its body isn't very strongly fusiform, which is that sort of fish-like shape that you see in lots of fish, dolphins, sharks, ichthyosaurs. Um, it also it still has uh, digits that look like it could get around on land, maybe, and also are still not um, paddle shape really. They're, this reconstruction has them webbed. That's probably uh, likely true. Um, then we get to things like Cartorhynchus and Gripia, which are much closer to, you know, the actual, I would say, crown ichthyosaurs, but that's not true. Maybe use ichthyosaur. Um, and so these are still, like, you can see Cartorhynchus is probably doing things like coming onto land like a sea turtle. Like it might be um, like modern sea turtles laying eggs on land. But by the time you get to things like Shonosaurus, you're doing uh, what's called oviviparity, where what's most likely happening is the eggs are retained inside the body and then they are hatching in the body and then the young are coming out without the egg. And um, we actually have numerous fossils of pregnant uh, ichthyosaurs. Some of them may be in the process of giving birth and have died in childbirth, or some of them might actually be what's called a coffin birth, 
which um, is a result of decay gases building up in the uterus and then expelling or partially expelling the remains of the fetus, which is kind of gross, but it's a thing that happens. It happens in humans, it happens in other mammals, and it probably happened in ichthyosaurs too. Um, so sometimes you'll get people saying things like, oh, look, this animal must have been in the process of giving birth and then been just been immediately covered by some kind of catastrophic event. No, no, first of all, it didn't have to have actually been in the process of giving birth. It could have been a thing that happened as a decay process. Second, even if it were giving birth, things die in childbirth. That's a well-known phenomenon. Um, yep. It used to be very common in humans. It's now significantly less common in humans because we have lots of medical technology. But, I mean, you don't have to go back very far before childbirth was a very significant cause of death among women. So, all right, let's go on to the next slide unless Jackson has anything. Well, sounds good to me. Okay. Ah, Testudinata. Okay, so Testudinata is sort of broadly speaking the turtles and their buddies. Uh, so this is essentially things that are closer to turtles basically than they are to Saur Sauropterygians, which are things like plesiosaurs. But in the Triassic, there were more uh, Sauropterygians than just plesiosaurs. Um, so we're going to go sort of in the order of uh, most basal to most derived. So we have Unotosaurus. Uh, now, Unotosaurus is probably in Pan Um And the reason that it's associated is, in addition to various details, the biggest thing here is that it, like Papakelis, has broadened ribs. Unotosaurus was probably a burrower. And the broadened ribs are important because that's actually what forms the shell of a turtle. So they're actually extremely broad ribs. They're so broad in actual turtles that they fuse together into a hard shell. And this is a defensive measure. So the idea is something tries to nip at you and your big ribs deflect that and doesn't penetrate into, you know, your important organs. Sure, you now have a bite mark in the skin, but it's way easier to heal from a flesh wound than it is to heal from, like, punctured ribs and a collapsed lung. So, you know, you, so it's a priorities. Good, <laughs> priorities, right. Um, Papa Kelly's is doing just more of this, essentially. The ribs are even thicker. They're almost touching. And then we get an interesting development with Odontochelys, where we get what's called a plastron. So the plastron is the bottom shell, and it's not exactly clear uh, what structures these evolve from. I tend to favor the idea that they're gastralia, which are what are called belly ribs, which were common in many animals at this time, but now they're restricted basically to crocodilians and the tuatara in modern organisms. But, or are they restricted to turtles, the tuatara, and crocodilians, because if the plastron is in fact a derived belly rib, then that means that these are gastralia. Um, but it's interesting that we have a plastron, but not a carapace, which is what the top shell is called. And one of the ideas with this is it might be that Odontochelys was facing predation from ambush predators who would wait below it in the water column, and then they would rise up, which is actually a common hunting tactic for modern sharks. Um, there's this thing called counter shading, and a lot of uh, aquatic predators use it. Uh, orcas use it. Uh, sharks use it. The idea is you're dark on the top and lighter on the bottom so that from below you might blend in with the sky and from above you kind of just blend in with the murky depths. Philosophobia warning, a little late, but whatever. So perhaps the reason that it was important to have a plastron for Odontochelys is that it needed to uh, protect itself from below. One interesting thing is Odontochelys doesn't have teeth, but our next boy here, Pro uh, Pro Proganochelys, does. So I personally favor the idea that uh, Odontochelys probably wasn't directly on the line to turtles, but a number of groups, or sorry, a group of turtles evolved the, the plastron. Odontochelys lost its teeth in a separate lineage, and then some other lineage of plastronated, is a word I'm going to invent right now, uh, <laughs> stem turtles, independently lost their teeth after uh, Proganochelys, because Proganochelys also has a top shell, but it's also got teeth, which is weird. Modern turtles don't have teeth. Um, so we are getting some of that mosaicism in different ways, which makes it a little difficult to figure out exactly what the shape of the tree is at this very early point. But like I said, I personally favor the multiple loss of teeth, uh, because, well, quite frankly, lots of lineages lose teeth. It happens all the time. Yep. So I, I don't find it to be a stretch to say that more than one uh, lineage of testudine lost its teeth. Um, what do you Especially think, Especially if your teeth were already probably, like, getting smaller than the ancestral state. It's um, true. Uh, Organic Kelly's had fairly small teeth. Yeah, and so it's like, you know, it's just a matter of nipping what was already kind of small, and just doing it repeatedly, like, eh, I don't find that to be super crazy. Yeah. Um, 
these uh, uh, Pap Achilles and Odont Achilles uh, were both found within the past like decade. Um, so, you know, they they really fill in a lot of what was kind of unknown about turtle evolution. You had like Unotosaurus for a long time and Progan Achilles, and it's like, okay, well, we have sort of the endpoints of this process. What was in the middle? And these guys, and I believe even more recently, there have been like other uh, stem turtles that have been added to this, you know, this group. It's kind of a golden age for transitional forms, honestly. Some might say that, yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, well, I mean, we'll talk about whales, whales later, but like, you know, you had like Basilosaurus, and that was kind of it until the 90s. Wait, you know, that's Basilosaurus... not a lizard? No. So, no, but the sadly. name says King Lizard. Well, I don't make the rules. I just enforce them. <laughs> uh, but like, you know, Basilosaurus was it from like the early 1800s till the 90s. Then, you know, the 90s rolled around like, oh, hey, it's all these guys coming out of like India and Pakistan, which are whale like, but mm -hmm. not whales, you know, so they have involucra, yeah. which we'll talk about later. Yep, we will. So, anyway. All right, let's get the next slide then. Placodontia. So you might remember that earlier I said that there were sauropteria genes in the Triassic that were not, in fact, uh, plesiosaurs. And this is an example. So these guys look like turtles, but the thing is, they're not. And one of the biggest ways that you can tell is that uh, their shells are made of different structures. And often they're segmented, like we have with Seamotus, uh, where there's a, a front and a back shell. So these guys are actually more closely related to lizards than they are to turtles. Uh, they seem to have independently evolved the strategy of armor, but that's a thing that's occurred many times, right? Making your skin hard to puncture is a pretty yeah. good bet for protection, and so it's happened in uh, sauropterygians, it's happened in turtles, it's happened in mammals, it's happened in pseudosuchians, it's happened in dinosaurs. Um, it currently has happened in some lizards, like the horny toad, who, fun fact, not a toad and only friendly, just wants to be friends. <laughs> Um, but these, this is an, 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 a well-armored lizard. The reason, you know, they're called horny is in addition to just actually wanting to be friends, they actually have a whole lot of horn-like spikes all over. Um, so, uh, these Sauropterygians were aquatic reptiles. They swam primarily, we think, with their limbs, um, which is a weird thing because we don't think they probably swam the same way as modern sea turtles, which is primarily using the forelimbs. Their hind limbs seem to be similarly robust, and so we don't know exactly how they were using them. Were they using them all in phase? Did they have some kind of phase offset? Were they using like a, a rowing motion, or did each limb have its own offset? It's not clear. There has been lots of papers going back and forth in the literature about the various benefits and drawbacks of each thing. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think that um, like most tetrapods, they probably had more than one gate, and they use different gates for different things. Um, yeah. I think that's very likely. And so it could be that many of these papers are right. And when they say things like, oh, they're all in phase, well, okay, that gets you a nice quick burst of speed, but it's hard to maintain. Okay, well, then if you get rowing motion, you can get a more medium amount of speed with less energy use. And then for slow, careful maneuvering, maybe there was an offset between each limb. I, I don't see why that's so crazy. But then again, I'm not an expert in this field. So, you know, don't take my word for it. But um, bum I don't know. I, it tends to be the case that like it's it's a combination of things. I think very rarely is it ever like it was this and only this and nothing else. You True. know, because life is complicated. Life is very complicated. Yeah. All right. So unless you want to go on. Uh, oh, by the way, Hinotus is adorable because he looks like a piece of toast. <laughs> he does look like a piece of toast. I love it. I'm, uh, I'm so looking Peter, at. If you want to go on to the next one? I, I'm looking at Placidus. It, it looks like an animal that died at Ikea while shopping for a new aquarium. It's a weird Maybe picture. it went into the infinite uh, Ikea. It's, it's, it's a strange, <laughs> it was a, it was a strange the picture. The... I, uh, just... He was in the beyond part of Bed Bath & Beyond. Ooh. Ah, okay. That's through that special door that's marked employees only. Don't go back there, trust me. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you value your sanity, don't go into that one. Yeah. All right, let's... <laughs> There we go. Sauropterygia, which we were, we're already talking about, but, you know, uh, we're yeah. now getting closer to the Sauropterygians that would make it out of the Triassic. Uh, so we have 
uh, Pachypterosaurus, Nothosaurus, and Pistosaurus. And so what you're seeing here is more adaptations for speed and less for armor. So some of these include bigger limbs, uh, more fusiform body shapes. Um, it's not depicted in any of these, but current thinking is that plesiosaurs probably started to develop tail flukes at some point, and it might be this early. It's hard to say because they don't leave great uh, fossil evidence. But um, when you're getting into this area, you're starting to see some really strict adaptations for just moving in water. So for instance, the elbow joints start to become locking and they can't move anymore. And the shoulder and hip joints start to become significantly more flexible. And things like the shoulder girdles will start to fuse together at this stage. Um, and so this is sort of the establishment of what will end up being throughout most of the Mesozoic, one of the major marine groups of tetrapods, which is going to be plesiosaurs eventually. But at this point, there's still more than just plesiosaurs running around in the Triassic. And there were a whole bunch of other aquatic things that weren't plesiosaurs or ichthyosaurs. So it, the Triassic was a really big time of experimentation for diapsids. They went into basically every niche you can think of and in extremely weird ways. And most of it didn't make it out of the Triassic. What made it out of the Triassic was mostly dinosaurs, but we're not there yet. <laughs> yes. So, unless I Jackson, this message. Okay. Well, let, let's get to the next slide. Archosauria. So you guys are probably all familiar with this, many of the animals in this group because this is the group that includes the dinosaurs, birds included, as well as the stem birds, pterosaurs. And also on the other side, the side you don't hear as much about, but that was also very diverse and very interesting, the Pseudosuchians. So what is it that makes an archosaur an archosaur? Well, we have down at the bottom a pretty good list. Antorbital and mandibular fenestrae. So the antorbital fenestrae thing is actually a diapsid characteristic, but archosaurs all, at least in the basal condition, have this. Well, I think that's what it's saying. It's like it's below archosaur, archosauria. Right. Sorry, but mandibular know. fenestra is, a, is, in fact, an important thing. So this is a fairly characteristic thing for archosaurs, per se. The mandibular fenestra is a little hole uh, towards the back of the dentary, and uh, the other bones that border it, uh, if I remember correctly, are the angular and serangular bones. Now, some archosaurs do secondarily lose this feature, but at first, it's there primarily as a weight-saving mechanism to keep a strong jaw that doesn't have to weigh as much. Uh, dorsal osteoderms, this is a feature that does in fact tend to go away in various lineages. It's pretty strong in the uh, Pseudosuchia, but when you get to the sort of bird side of things, that tends to become less, uh, less, less noticeable. Air sac system is a question and belly breathing is a question. So there's a reason for this. Modern, the only animals for whom we have definitive information about the respiration are crocodilians and birds. Birds have an air sac system and crocodilians use what's called a hepatic piston where their liver moves up and down in their belly and that causes their lungs to you know, uh, shrink and grow and they draw in air that way. It's not clear what the base of archosauria would have done for respiration. Um, there has been some evidence very recently published, I don't have the paper to hand though, um, that indicates that some crocodilians actually do have a unidirectional airflow in their respiratory system, which is a commonality with birds, which would mean that if that's actually, you know, a common inheritance, then the base of Archosauria probably did have that. We also know that many dinosaurs and pterosaurs apparently had air sacs, but it's not clear if they were important parts of the respiratory system or if perhaps they were air saving, oh, sorry, um, uh, weight saving things, right? So, you know, if you need to have a big, a big old neck to reach out to plants, well, if you fill a bunch of it with air, it's not such a big strain. That could be, I personally think it's more likely that they were at least incorporated into the uh, respiratory system as significant stores of volume that could then pass through the lungs. Um, but hey, maybe I'm wrong about that. Also, we do know that there were also some air sacs and some extended uh, skeletal pneumaticity in parts of Pseudosuchia. So they also seem to have had some air sac thing going on to some extent. Um, so then we get, so that's where we get to sort of the archosauromorpha here, where Euparcaria is almost an archosaur, but probably not an archosaur. 
Um, in Archosauria, we have nests with vegetation. So this is a commonality that you'll see in birds and crocodiles even today. Crocodilians usually build up a pile of uh, rotting vegetation, and then that rotting keeps the eggs warm. Birds tend to use uh, things like straw and twigs, uh, which is not providing the heat directly because the brooding of the parents, um, usually either the female or the male and the female, although there are some species where males do a whole lot more brooding than normal. Um, parental care of young, we already talked about that. Both groups of uh, extant um, archosaurs, crocodilians, and dinosaurs take extensive care of their young for quite a while in most species, there are exceptions. Um, but also it wasn't clear if this was something that extended into the past, but we now know that it does because we found things like dinosaur nests and we found evidence in trackways of multi-generational uh, social groups of some dinosaurs and things like that. So it does in fact seem like, yes, at least many dinosaurs were taking careful care of their young. Um, the Pseudosuchians, we're not sure if they were doing it to the same extent, but on the basis of what we see in crocodilians, uh, there was probably still significant parental care, at least for the first bit of life. So when these, the young are very small. Uh, extensive vocal communication. This is another thing that both groups are known for today. It's hard to say exactly what the vocal range of extinct animals were because things like voice boxes, syrinxes, hyoid bones tend to be pretty scant in the fossil record. But both groups do this today. So uh, crocodilians today have a number of hisses, rumbles. Um, they even use some things like infrasound that you can't hear, although you might be able to feel it if you were in the water with them, which I don't suggest. Um, <laughs> but birds, on the other hand, tend to be, most of their communication tends to be within the range of human hearing and fairly loud. So you're probably very aware of things like songbirds. Mm -hmm. um, parasagittal stance, flow through young, uh, lung. So those are both question marks. Um, one of the things with the parasitical stance is it does seem like the two major groups, Pseudosuchia versus Ornithodira, have different ways of uh, uh, getting this parasitical stance where the legs are sort of right below the body. Um, Pseudosuchians had a tendency to do this thing called pillar erect, where the femoral head is actually directly on top of the femoral shaft, and the hip joint actually faces down dorsally. Whereas uh, ornithodirans tend to have the femoral head offset at an angle from the femoral shaft, and they have a horizontally oriented uh, hip joint. So was parasagittal gait a common thing? I tend to say probably not. I think the common ancestor of Archosauria probably had splayed legs, um, and that very early on in both groups, they developed different types of um, parasagittal gaits. Although the Pseudosuchians retained way more flexibility, and so even some animals today that don't actually have a parasitical gait all the time, like modern crocodilians, can actually tuck their legs under the body for a more efficient, uh, well, not more, necessarily more efficient, but a more rapid overland traversal. It's actually less efficient for them because they have to hold their bodies up with a lot more muscular force. But uh, it does allow them to cross land uh, more quickly. And you can see this uh, even here on YouTube if you just search uh, alligator or crocodile high walk, H-I-G-H, -H, walk. Uh, this is where they pick their bellies up off the ground and they walk with their legs more or less uh, vertical. So we'll jump over to Pseudosuchia. Enlarged, there we go, calcaneal tuber, which is the heel. One of the things you see with Pseudosuchians is they tend to be plantar gray, which is something that they have in common with humans and bears, which is they walk on their wrists and heels. They don't just walk up on their toes like most ornithodirons did. Um, Two rows of dorsal osteoderms. You can still see this with crocodiles where they have these extensive osteoderms. And we get osteoderms all throughout the fossil record of Pseudosuchia. In fact, a uh, one group, Aeosauria, which you can see right up after Asuchia, uh, their osteoderms are so common that they're one of the few tetrapod remains that have ever been suggested as an index fossil for various pe geological periods. Because <laughs> generally speaking, tetrapods are just not common enough or widespread right. enough. Yeah. That's but, cool. uh, there have been some Aetosaur, uh osteoderm fossils that are just everywhere because they shed them. So um, mm. so we'll jump over to Ornithodira, where we get cervicals distinct from dorsals, uh, elongate tibiae and metatarsi. So the tibia and the metatarsals are adaptations to more efficient running, basically. So one of the things about 
animals is typically animals that run fast tend to have long lower legs and relatively short femurs. So elongating the tibia and the metatarsals, which are the bones in your foot that are before the actual toe bones that stick out. Um, we're also getting this question mark loss of bony armor, but it does re-evolve. And there are some relatively basal dinosaurs that might have had this primitive condition. So for instance, um, Ceratosaurus and later Ceratosaurus, like uh, some Abelosaurus, still have very similar uh, skeets to what you get in um, Archosaur, or sorry, in Pseudosuchium. So maybe it was retained in some lineages, maybe not. It's a little, it's, it's a pretty big question there. A uh, parasitical stance, at least at this point, does seem to be common to Ornithodira. We don't have any Ornithodirans that I'm aware of that don't have a parasitical stance with a horizontal hip joint. Um, now, this is where we start getting into Pterosauria. And uh, actually, I believe this chart is a little out of date. I believe Lagerpa today has been yes. reassessed as closer to Pterosauria than it is to dinosaurs. So Lagerpa today should actually be on the other side of that branch. Yeah, there was a bit of debate um, over it where like some researchers put them near Pterosauria originally, and then they got kind of moved. Now they've sort of moved back. So, yeah. Which, yep. again, because we're dealing with things that are all kind of similar to each other. <laughs> yeah. And so it's kind of hard to figure out where they go. Well, one thing you can do is if you look at um, the Lagosuchid up there, which is probably just Lagosuchus, and uh, Lagerpaton, they're virtually indistinguishable. But according to most researchers, Lagosuchidae ends up being closer to dinosaurs and yeah. Lagerpate ends up being closer to pterosaurs. And that's another one of these examples where it's like, at the very base of this tree, these things are very hard to tell they're apart. Um, and then we get up into dinosauria with the elongate pubis and ischia. There's other things in, you know, dinosauria and dinosaur morpha. Um, we have Silosauridae, which only experts would know, wouldn't know that that's a dinosaur. There's very few differences. Um, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but we will talk about the crotarsal ankle in the Pseudosochians on the left and the mesotarsal ankle on ornithodirons on the right. So the big thing that you're looking at is you can see the astragalus listed A and the calcanium listed C. In the pseudosuchians, this joint has a little ball and socket-like attachment. It allows them to turn their ankles um, side to side, basically. So if you're sitting at your desk and you can move your feet so that they point away from each other and then point in towards each other, that's you doing this kind of motion that's allowed in pseudosuchians with this joint. Now, this allows for greater flexibility, which allows them to have multiple forms of locomotion. Um, they will use it in terms of swimming motions, things like that. But the trade-off to flexibility is less strength and more energy intense locomotion. Ornithodirons went for the opposite strategy where they have less flexibility because the astragalus and the calcanium don't actually interface against each other. They just help the metatarsals swing up and down in one single plane. This is a stronger joint, it's less prone to injury, it's less energetic, but it also means that you have significantly less flexibility. So it's it, there's always trade-offs in evolution. You never get to be Superman. Yes. But the real question is, did they have a fibula? Uh, I believe no. I think that thing listed as F is actually uh, not We're a sorry. fibula. I'm, I'm sorry, not a fibula, a tibula. A tibula. tibula. I'm sorry. Tib I, yeah, I, mean, I, I tried to say sorry. the wrong thing and ended up saying the right thing. <laughs> well, for, you know, after the tibula debacle for like, oh, I think like two months, every time I tried to say either tibia or fibula, I had to stop myself from saying tibula. Right. Because <laughs> it was just, it, it gets stuck in my brain. It's just this ridiculous thing. And then it was just in my brain. If you guys don't know what we're talking about, you're probably better <laughs> off. I feel like that. We're, we bring up stuff a lot that's like, oh, you poor souls, if you haven't heard about this. Look, this is what you call, like, fan service. Our, our yeah. streams are basically fan service for our viewers. And um, if you know, if you catch all of these little things, then, I mean, you've been an eagle-eyed viewer of us and our yes. various, uh, the various happenings in our YouTube circle. <laughs> so... Uh, let's go yeah. on to the next slide, unless you have anything else, Jackson. Um, I think this is probably a good place to call it. Oh, all right. Well, in that case... Um, we got about eight minutes left. All right. Well, I think I we didn't get through the Triassic. We didn't get to some of the interesting Triassic things like Tenistrophius or things like that, but that's okay. There's still next week, I believe. Yes. Well, we'll yes. be back 
next week to finish off the Triassic. Probably we haven't even talked the about the dinosaurs. We, even we talked about a little bit about the dinosaurs just now. I mean, you know, we haven't got into like specific taxa, yet, True. really. Uh, which you know we'll do next time. So. Uh, Dapper, what's going on over on your channel? Well, let's see. Um, right now, uh, on the 23rd, I am looking at a premiere of a mirror of our discussion about the process of evolution part two. Nice. Nice. Um, if you haven't seen that it's here on Jackson wheat's channel, it was, uh, like a month ago. Uh, something like that. Time is fluid. Yeah. yeah. Time, I don't even know if time really exists. Um, <laughs> so then on Tuesday, Tuesday, uh, the 26th Jackson. You're going to be on my channel. Yes. We're going to talk about Absolutely. Bad Jackson, Dr. Charles Jackson. The other Jacks. Oh, I name dropped. Oops, never mind. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're talking about Bad Jackson. <laughs> one of the Bad Jacksons. <laughs> um, the one who doesn't have a felony. <laughs> Anyways, what? Uh... <laughs> I mean, many Jacksons do not do not have a felony. I'm sure several <laughs> other ones do. <laughs> if, um, if you were paying attention the whole stream, you might understand what we're talking about. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, and neither of the Jacksons that are going to be on my channel, either voluntarily or involuntarily, have anything to do with fish reproduction. Uh, let's see. Then on... Um, so that was Tuesday. Wednesday, not on my channel, but on Cheshire Vic's channel, we're going to be playing Dungeons & Dragons. Nice. So I'm going to be playing a dwarf... or I've been playing a dwarf artificer. Ben Tovin, who you might know if you watch my channel, uh, is our halfling druid. Cheshire Vic is a tabaxi rogue. Uh, Guts of Gibbon is an imp rogue using a homebrewed imp class, uh, or sorry, imp uh, race. Her fiance is a Goliath fighter. TD Lane, who you might know if you um, hang out on me and Jackson's channels and uh, streams and whatnot, uh, is a kobold barbarian. And Maddie from Science Side Up is our dungeon master. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of people that you might be familiar with playing Dungeons and Dragons every other Wednesday. Um, let's see. Thursday should finally be my first of two videos about Kurt Wise calling people cowards for doing taxonomy, basically. Nice. Yeah, it's 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 a very weird video that he made. Um, <laughs> it's bizarre. I have no idea what's happening on the thirtieth. Um, the third will be. Uh, Kent with Bent. At least that's the plan. The 4th, May the 4th, Star Wars Day. I'm not doing Star Wars. Instead, on my off-topic channel, Top Hats Off, I'm going to be streaming Episode 2 of Power Rangers Jungle Beasts, a stream, live-streamed RPG featuring myself, Maddie from Science Side Up, TD Lane, as well as other people whom you probably don't know because I don't know them from YouTube. I know them from other places. But um, we had a lot of fun in our first episode. They got their morphers. They had a rather disastrous battle, but that's okay. It was kind of designed for it to go poorly. And it did without me cheating at all because it was really tough. Um, and so we're going to pick up with them getting a lot of exposition dumping from their mentor. So nice. if that's stuff that interests you, come hang out. I noticed that Jackson wasn't in the chat for episode one. Uh, don't know how that happened. I'm pretty, wow. I'm 95% sure I have. I, that's I'm pretty sure I was there. That sounds about right. Name two of the Rangers. Um, uh, blue and red. No, not give the colors. The names. That sounds like a name to me. Blue, you're blue. You're red. Can you can you name all the colors that are being used? I don't deserve this. Yeah, see, you weren't there. I don't know what I did to <laughs> to earn your ire, Dapper. You said that you were there, and then you couldn't back it up. That's what I I in, I can't I can't not prove I wasn't there. <laughs> I don't know if that came out correctly. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not sure either. I didn't fully parse it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's what that's how far ahead I'm going to look on for what I'm up to. Um, oh, also, sometime next month. I may be trying to set up a thing where uh, Mr. Wilford, uh, Peter from Paleo Logos, and I all come on my channel and we talk about how bad um, Zeitgeist Part 1 is. Because it's really bad. It gets like history, religion, and astronomy badly wrong all in like a short little section. It's amazing. Is that a, a movie? That's a 
quote unquote documentary. It's basically just conspiracy theory, the non ironic documentary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> sounds interesting. That that sounds interesting. So yeah. Yeah. Look, this is a thing that perpetuates the idea that Jesus is a sun god because the words sun and sun are homophones in English. No. Yes. Never mind the no. fact that they're not homophones in any of the relevant languages like Latin or Greek or Aramaic or Hebrew. No. Yes, I'm being very serious. Jesus Christ. Well, exactly. <laughs> oh my you get gosh. it. That's that's terrible. Yeah, because you know lazy. That's just awful. The Greek words weos and elios, those those are identical words. That's oh, sun man. and sun in, in Greek, in case you didn't catch on. That makes me feel sad. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. So um, hopefully we can get that going. Um, although Peter from Paleologos is a little a little annoyed at me right now. Um, I don't understand why, and I don't really That's blame okay. him. That's okay. That's uh, okay. We, but, um, we like him. I mean, he's a, he's a cool kid, I, but uh, we definitely yeah. do not agree on everything. So, you know, that's fine. Yeah. You don't have to agree on everything. I'm pretty okay. sure we're going to agree on just about everything to do with uh, Zeitgeist Part 1, because it's really bad. Yeah, I mean, if it's, yeah, if it's Garbo, then yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Additional spoilers. Horus, the Egyptian god, didn't have 12 disciples. He was once shown in one fresco in one tomb with 12 farmers in the same panel. That's where this claim comes from. Well, oh, dear. Yeah, that's the level of scholarship we're going with. Well, you know, I mean, the 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 history, um, you know, conspiracy theory guys, they're just it's whatever they can pull together, basically, um, you know, it just goes. Uh, what's his name? The was it Zechariah, the guy, the ancient aliens. Zechariah dude. Sitchin, yeah. yeah. Actually, like, I'm thinking about doing some ancient aliens content, uh, too. I, I mean, his stuff is just bonkers. Like other yeah. archaeologists just laugh at him like uh, he because he other... has actual uh, archaeological credentials but he just gets laughed at by everyone else what he doesn't have are seriological credentials yet he still yeah. purports to be translating sumerian which spoiler alerts he cannot <laughs> yeah uh i i took an archaeology class uh at lsu and uh my, my professor kind of mentioned him once she was like i watch ancient aliens is like a guilty pleasure Oh, that's I watch it for that reason too. It's it's hilarious when they're talking about like the aliens destroy the dinosaurs so that they could pretend to be Jesus. And it's just like, okay, okay, sure, why not? Yeah, let's do it. That sounds as as real as anything else. Why not? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, what was it? She because I think she worked with um, was it like Aztecs or or Mayans, something like that. Um, oh, they love the Mayans and the Aztecs. And and she mentioned how there's i don't know if you call it a fresco or, or whatever a, a mural um where there's a a like a king or emperor it's king pakal um, it's his um it's this the tombstone covering it's a it's a bas relief where it looks like he's well um the guy the, the ancient aliens guy says it's like oh he's being lifted up into the sky by aliens but actually he's like descending into the, like, yeah, the underworld, he's, isn't he? he's descending into the uh, underworld via the world yeah. tree, and what are supposedly like like billows of s exhaust smoke are just like it's just like the tail of the feathered serpent, a common motif in depictions about like things to do with the death and the underworld. Yeah, and like yeah, it's just a tail plume of the feathered serpent. Sorry, like you can actually also see the feathered serpent's face. <laughs> like it's, it's it's not really all that subtle. Well, you know, I, if if they cared about being right, they would be. So, you know, is what it is. Yeah, they just prefer to be like thinly veiled racist conspiracy theorists. If it wasn't white people, couldn't happen. Couldn't be built, basically. Yep, the only uh, thing white people needed it... help with was Stonehenge. No, what was a? Uh... No, it wasn't. It was a. Uh, it was actually at. Uh, the, the, the Faithless Forum that I went to, um, I think I was talking with somebody about like ancient aliens, like is a lot, there's a lot of like, v <laughs> as you said, thinly veiled racism in there. And if you're yep. just a casual sort of, you know, conspiracy person, you might not realize that. But if, you know, if you actually start looking into it, it's like, oh no, they're just saying if literally if, if it wasn't a white 
a predominantly white culture, it just couldn't be made. It, there had to be aliens because, uh, you know, people with darker skin can't figure out like principles of physics and how to like move Only white heavy objects and move stones. That's just how it works, apparently. Yeah. So it's uh, that's that's under the surface, you know. So, yeah, it's anyway. it's very rarely explicit. Like they don't say, "Oh, the ancient Egyptians needed anti gravity technology because as non white people." They couldn't figure out how to move big rocks. Yeah. But you start to notice that no medieval cathedral seemed to have needed anti-gravity stone melting tools <laughs> right. from aliens. Right. That's, that's just fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. It's like, mm, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, as of right now, the only thing that I know is happening on my channel is the um, is this. Uh, you know, so next Thursday, same time, same place, we'll be talking, we'll, we'll be continuing with the Mesozoic. We probably won't finish it, uh, but we'll get, you know, a start. So, um, and then Peter, thank you for hosting as always. Greatly appreciated. You are most welcome. Our Lord and Savior. You are most welcome. And thank you everyone who is in the... side chat uh believe have a wonderful evening and we'll catch you all next time okay